and the chaos of the budget timeline overrun is, is upon us. Uh, we were going we're gonna to get started. Uh, I wanted to get started at 1.30, but just with people's transition and so forth, we're going to get going. Uh, right behind us at 2.30, we're going to end up having the House uh, Health Committee. We're going to do a 30-minute slip today. Um, so we'll have some members filter up as we talk, but I want to go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to thank the members of the committee. We have a good, good ch chunk of our good plurality of our committee here today, but we're going to get started with, with who we have. Because what I really want is I want to give Dr. V.K. Coomer an opportunity to, to present his research today. Um, I'd alluded earlier on the floor, if you guys weren't here for our general session during the uh, invite resolutions, we recognize Dr. Coomer with a, with a resolution. Um, for those of you who don't know him or, or, or that were not here uh, for the earlier presentation, um, Dr. Coomer is a Regents Professor of Marketing at Georgia State University, the JMAC uh, <clears throat> Robinson College of Business. Um, and is an internationally published author, is a fellow at the Premier School of Business in China, the Premier School of Business in India, um, the ISB in Hyderabad, which is India's business school. And he has um, been in Georgia for some time now and uh, been uh, continues to be the most published academic in the top marketing journals in the world. And uh, we've, uh, what I wanted to do, though, is I wanted to give him a chance to talk about his, uh, his research. Um, you know, we really have a, um, a focus in Georgia that sometimes is too focused in on, on biotech and IT, which we are centers for that, as you know, around the, around the country. But I want to also want to look at, as I joke with Dr. Coomer, um, the dismal science, economics, and his, uh, his marketing work is being received within the broader umbrella of econ uh, for, for various international awards. And I wanted him to kind of break down for our committee um, the, 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 the kind of put a, in layman's terms the research he and his team of about 25 researchers and staff members at Georgia State are involved in um, that sometimes we wouldn't see because they may be in academic journals. But let's have Dr. Coomer translate that which is cutting edge, bleeding edge, marketing research mm -hmm. for people who are policymakers in ways that we can help make that even more relevant in our, in our community. So with that, Dr. Coomer, thank you so much for being with our committee today. Pleasure. Chairman Setzler and the members of the Science and Technology Committee and the audience, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share our vision, our journey in uh, creating new knowledge, especially in the state of Georgia. And so what I've done is put together a presentation. It covers four aspects of it. The first aspect is about our center. What, what does our center do? Why a center is necessary for us to accomplish what we are doing? And second is, what are the innovations that come about in the center that you see, select case studies? Then the whole uh, innovations are, are couched, or the foundation for that is a custom evaluation theory which is our unique contribution where so many Nobel Prize winning theories have been proposed for valuing stocks, but none of those principles hold good for valuing customers. And today, every company wants to value the customers, whether they are most valuable or least valuable or somewhat valuable. So how do they measure the value? So you need a theory for that. So we are the ones who have developed this theory, and it just got published in this month's a journal of marketing, uh, and I'll share with you what the theory is. And then finally, the thought leadership at uh, our center, exactly like, so far as a cumulative body of knowledge, what have we created? So just to go with our vision of our center, uh, in, in simple terms, we just want to be unique in the world in producing knowledge that all others have said it's not possible to solve. That's the challenge we take. So how do we take up the challenge? Um, many companies, CEOs, CMOs come to us and say, I have this problem. Uh, for example, one of the Fortune 500 companies in Atlanta, they send out a lot of direct marketing communications. And, and they had two types of communication that they send. One is like, if you do business with us, you get a lot of discounts. Another type of communication they sent to their clients was that we will take care of your business. We will grow with you. We'll make sure that you make money. So relationship building. The question was to which of their, say, two, three million customers uh, they should send a relational message, 
and to which of them they should send economic message at a given time. And so we were able to innovate, build a model, and give it to them to showcase that these 80,000 clients, this period relational message, this one million economic message, the next month you flip it. So by doing this adjustment, the company makes multi-million dollar gain. This is our story, bread and butter of our center. The mission here is also to encourage and solicit active participation across disciplines. That is the beauty of it. So we, our research encompasses marketing, finance, accounting, statistics, information systems, epidemiology, to just to name a few. So we want to become the leading center for cutting edge knowledge creation, and then we also are the leaders in customer engagement framework that we have. And, and then we are number one in terms of published research papers in major journals over the last 10 years, and, and then bringing innovation to the classroom. That is another important thing in Georgia State in our master's program uh, right now, and then slowly into the undergraduate program is that all this research we do, we bring it to the classroom immediately. So our Georgia State students, MBA students and MS students are in a unique position to get this new knowledge that nobody else has been exposed to. And, and finally, what uh, keeps us going is basically the academic business uh, incubator that we work very closely with the businesses in our center on a weekly basis, we have some CEO or a CMO of uh, companies in, in the US coming, visiting us, and telling us about their problem and asking us to solve. So if you look at the interdisciplinary pillars here, you see across all businesses that we have, finance, marketing, accounting, geosciences. So we have visiting scholars from, today we have visiting scholars from four countries, India, China, Russia, and Poland all bringing various skill sets uh, to, to solve problems. In terms of the elements of SEPSEM itself, you see we have people, we have process, we resources, and one of the beauty of our center is that the university uh, provides, and the university and the College of Business provides support to our center as an investment, and so all we worry about is to produce cutting edge knowledge. As, as a result, we bring in the, the talented people and we execute the study with the highest efficiency and synergy. So what do we do the best? Bringing academia and practice closer. So what is our report card? If you look at our report card, we produce custom research, just like the one I mentioned to you about economic message or relational message. We solve real-time business problems, and we host worldwide thought leadership events, meaning we had uh, the theory and practice in marketing conference in, in, in our field at Georgia State. Only four other universities have had it before, which is Harvard, Columbia, um, Yale, and Stanford or so. So we were the fifth one along the lines of those schools to host it. And then we also provide certificate of excellence in brand and customer management to our master's students, and we offer executive education in, that speed, in this uh, area. But most importantly, the encouragement we do, wherever we go and give a talk, people read from all over the world and come and spend a year in our center in a given year, at least four or five people. And we are also uh, fortunate to have C-level executives willing to work with us to do the experiments, field experiments, to see our models work, how to what extent they work. So we have done major work for almost every Atlanta company that you can name so far. So what have we created as a unique knowledge? So we have created this sample of metrics dashboard. I'm just showing you a sample where I, this morning in my speech also I mentioned about engagement as the key nugget that all of us focus on. So in this case, how a company can engage their customers in terms of increasing the brand perception, increasing the profit from customers, increasing the referrals from customers, increasing the influence, social media influence the customer brings in, as well as the feedback the customer gives. And also uh, how a company's salesperson can be valued more or less based on their engagement with the customers. So, and, and even in a nonprofit, in a university setting, we are able to bring in the alumni and measure their donor lifetime value at a level that what really makes, just to give you a hint of what are the key drivers of uh, 
somebody, an alumni, to give money to the university, three key drivers that we observe in our research. One key driver is during the time they were there, whether they went to all the sports games or any of those you know, cultural events or sports events, that's one thing. Second, both the husband and the wife, if they went to the school, then there's a higher likelihood for them to give a higher donation. And the third most important thing is that as soon as they graduated, did the school do anything to engage them, get them in you know, early on? So some of these drivers that you see um, that we produce to get the engagement value go up. So th these are some of the insights that we provide to either be the university or be uh, the companies. So I'm going to give you about five or six one-page case study. Let's take IBM, which all of us know. What was a unique uh, problem for IBM uh, a few years ago was that they were sending a lot of marketing communication to their business-to-business -to -business clients. And they have like four million customers and maybe two million active cl clients. And they send a lot of 60 million touches, or so 60 million pieces of communication. The key question is, how many times a customer should be contacted in a given year? What is the optimal number? And when I go pick the optimal number, what message do I communicate to the client? What products should I pitch to them or services? So we built a model for them saying that this is the optimal contact and this is the message you should deliver. They exactly did it with 216 customers as a field study. We told them you'll make $20 million. They made $19.2 million, exactly. So what did we do? We published with the marketing executive at IBM in marketing science. So we were able to publish. So this is the advantage of working with the companies for us that they allow us to publish in top marketing journal to showcase our innovation. You know, rather than asking money to them, saying that we'll do a consulting, we, we don't do that. We just do thought leadership work. But in return, we ask the company's permission to publish the work. Procter & Gamble is another company that all of us are familiar with. They are in multiple markets. In India, they had a unique problem. They are in the multiple product categories. In the detergent product category, they had uh, entered in year 2000, and they decreased the price over a five-year period to increase the sales. You know, they went going down, uh, they started decreasing the price every year. But what happened is, what they expected was the sales to go up. Sales went up, but overall revenue was flat. So they said uh, that the CEO at that time uh, just mentioned that, can you help us find why our revenue is not going up? So we built the model, me and our doctoral students, uh, you know, center built the model to show that, in fact, the customers are price inelastic. That's where the economics come, which means we can raise the prices. Rather, P&G was doing the opposite, decreasing the price. We told them to increase the price. They did it. The next year, they made $43 million in one category, detergent category. And that is the study that we published with the P&G executives co-authoring in marketing science again. So this is the kind of uniqueness that we do. And Georgia Aquarium, our own aquarium here, where Bernie Marcus um, is, 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 the ben, uh, is the one who founded this and gave the money. So their board consists of all the university presidents. And our president, uh, Mark Becker, was there in, in a board meeting. And when Bernie said, for the last five years, our attendance and revenue is going down, who can help to reverse? So our president said that we have this SEPSEM, uh, Center for Excellence in Brand and Custom Management. Um, you can talk to VK and see what he can do. They came, the CEO and the CMO came to our center. We spoke. We built the model with the data. Next year, it was the only one of the 20 aquariums in the country that reversed the trend, and attendance went up by 10%. Revenue went up by 12%. So this is, again, it was published with the CMO of um, uh, Georgia Aquarium uh, in marketing science. So this is, again, it, this is a not-for-profit. IBM was a B2B company. P&G was a business-to-consumer company. This was um, a not-for-profit uh, aquarium. Then Ralph Lauren, if you take worldwide luxury brand uh, fashion. So they had a very unique problem of customers coming in and buying occasionally but not coming back. So what can they do to make the customer come back again and what products they can upsell, cross-sell to them 
and also how can they find more customers like the profitable customers. And we used customer lifetime value framework and solved it, and they found 42% increase in same store sales increase for the bottom 10 stores, which was losing money. So again, we published this in a major journal, in Journal of Retailing, and this is the last example of Hokey Pokey, which is a small business. So we talk about a lot of startups and small business. Here is a startup, ice cream retailer. They don't have marketing budget, but they want to grow. What can we do? So we used social media to help them grow. How did we use the social media, the innovation? So Google and WPP had a competition worldwide to say who can develop an algorithm to measure the monetary value of a tweet or a Facebook like. So me and my doctoral student, we worked together and developed an algorithm to solve that problem, how to monetize a like, or what is the monetary value of a like or a tweet. Then Google, we won the first prize in that competition, and then they said go and, and implement it in a retail environment and show it actually works. So this retailer, ice cream retailer, who is now nationwide in India, uh, approached us and then we built this implementation for them. The simple thing is, all you need to do for this kind of campaign to be successful is to pick an influencer in the social media. Example, in Atlanta, if you want to introduce a new brand of ice cream, and our model will tell you who you should pick as a seed to spread the message about uh, the ice cream. If you are uh, running for a political office, who sh you should pick as a seed to write great things about you so that the message will spread. Who you should not pick so that the message will die immediately. And some of, I'll give you four drivers, how do we identify that? One, whoever spends the most time in the social media. And whoever has got a larger network size, followers and followings. And the third one is like who's exhibiting generosity, meaning, any goodness I get, I want to share with others. So we look at the history of their behavior, and then we pick. And then reciprocity, which means you give me some message, then I give back some other message. So these criteria, we have quantified it, and we can easily pick, looking at who is talking to whom in the social media, and pick the seeds. We did that for Hokey Pokey, and their ROI went up by 83%. Their sales growth went up by uh, 40 40%. The brand awareness went up by 49%. So all these uh, statistics, again, this was published in Marketing Science, one of the top journals uh, for the, the know-how that we bring in. And Prudential, financial services, again, when we were in, in Connecticut, we executed this, but then the results, when we were in Georgia State, we accumulated the results, which is everybody sells variable annuity. And you ask any of the financial advisor, they'll say it's a commodity. But we created a selling message for a Prudential variable annuity such that if a client goes to Prudential and says, I want to buy a variable annuity such that I want to minimize my regret. Another one says, I want to maximize my return. So how do we take the same product, which has got all these unique characteristics, but just pitch the right message to the client so that they buy Prudential variable annuity versus something else? And in one year, with our model, Prudential made half a billion dollars, $450 million in just 13 months after using our emotion quotient tool. So again, these are some of the ways that we have helped companies. This is where the academic business interaction comes in. So what is the underlying theory behind all of this? You know, This is where we come in our, our unique um, name that we created is the cu customer valuation theory. How do firms value customers? And if you look at, you know, first thing, why do we invest in any asset? We want more returns from that. If you like a stock, you know, you look at the stock, like we, we like a stock and we invest and grow, except the last three days is a bloodbath. But other than that, you've seen the market go up and you see the stocks going up and you invest more and more. And then Suppose you say, I don't want to invest all in financial sector. I want to have a diversified portfolio. So you'll have commodities, metals, and you'll have financial sector. So and finally, you'll also uh, rebalance the portfolio of stocks most of the times. So, yeah. so it's the same thing with customers. You want to invest in those customers who are going to buy more from you. You also want to have a group of customers that are going to be profitable, and so on. So, but, but 
the constant re-evaluating the portfolio for customers also is something that is sort of necessary because we all walk through the life cycle. You know, we need a product, suddenly we get married, and then we no longer need that product. So the life cycle matters. But given the similarities, can you apply those stock market theories, the Nobel Prize winning theories to valuing customers? And we say clearly not. I'll give you, um, I'll put this slide and give you three reasons why, three major reasons why we cannot apply that. First, if you like, say, IBM stock, and it's doing well. Dr. Kimmer, yes. f f forgive me. Uh, could, could you restate that again, the, 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 the thing you said you keep, that, that does not apply that, that you're speaking to here? I, I missed that. Forgive me for yeah, that. Sure. So I'm, I'm going to highlight that. So, so in terms of similarities, so in terms of similarities, firms want to, in, uh, so in, in terms of any, you and me as an investor, investing in stocks, we want to invest in those stocks that are showing potential for growth. So, and if it is growing, you want to put more and more money into that. And you also say that, well, I don't want to put all eggs in one basket, so I'm going to have a portfolio, some financial sectors, some high tech, some commodities, some metals. Why? Because in one, in one case, if the metals go down and the financial sector goes up, there's cushion there to do that. And also, in the stock case, if to, like given today's market condition, you can rebalance the portfolio. Is if high techs are getting beaten badly, then you rebalance it quickly. Sell the high tech, buy something else, staple goods, which just went down only by 3.2% as opposed to the entire market going up down by 7%. So that's what you do. But with the customers, if you really take, you are my customer and you are buying from me, how much more I can invest in you? I mean, there is a saturation point how much a customer will buy from you. So you cannot keep on investing in a customer as you can do with a stock and buy more and more stocks. You know, IBM stock is doing well. Instead of 100 stocks, you buy 1,000 stocks. This customer is buying from me. Instead of investing $100, I'm going to invest $1,000 in them. It's a waste because they're not going to buy more because they're investing $1,000. They have a size of the wallet that restricts them ultimately. Second, just like the stocks you have, some stocks returning, giving you high returns, some stocks today not giving you high returns, but when the market conditions flip, it'll reverse. But with respect to customers, no company would say, let me have a profitable customer and let me have a portfolio of a loss customer. Maybe next cycle something happens, the loss will become profitable, profitable will become loss on balance, I'm okay, doesn't happen. Every company wants only profitable customers. So again, that is a second deviation. Third, just like at any instant, you can rebalance the portfolio of stocks. You can sell today and buy another stock. You cannot fire a customer today and then pick another customer tomorrow. You need to build a relationship with the customers to make them buy. So completely all these well-known theories are not applicable for valuing customers. So that's where we show this difference in terms of stock valu valuation principles and customer valuation principles. And, and then we show that there are 12 reasons we show, but the three major ones are this, that one, you cannot apply the theory, and, and two, the principles behind that is not valid, and three, which is very critical, is that customers are very sensitive. And how do you really wine and dine with them, talk to them, build, nurture them, goes a long way because they not only buy from you, this is where we show they engage with you in three other ways. Then they bring in profitable prospects to you, their effort, then they write about you, good things in the social media, and then they give you feedback also. So how does the model work, our theory works? Anytime you want to measure a customer profitability, you see it's a function of what transactions that customers have shown in the past, then how much marketing a company has done to them, that is second. Then who the customers are. What is the demographic? What is the life cycle stage? Are they married? Are they senior citizens? Are they millennials? Who they are? And then the economic and environmental factors. Is the market growing? Is it a recessionary time period? Is the environment now um, promoting green products, organic products? And is this company now selling organic products? Today there was a very nice article about when you should buy organic products and for what categories you should buy organic products. We all jump in and go and buy it. And that article talks about, you know, 
look at and ask one question, which products probably they would put pesticides to treat? And if you have the answer, those are the ones you need to buy organic. Rest, don't waste money in organic. So clearly there are guidelines given. So we look at all those principles, the environment, economic, and build a model to predict customer profitability. How accurate is our model? When we built this model 17 years ago, our model accuracy was 50%. The latest model that we built and shown the accuracy, uh, uh, the, sorry, the accuracy was 50, now the accuracy is 96%. Only 4% error that we see in predictive accuracy of customer profitability. So it's come, down to, it's come up to that high uh, percentage. So what is this theory? which just got published in Journal of Marketing, um, January issue. It's got three components. And this theory was needed because stock valuation theory didn't work. And this theory it says that first component, the direct economic value contribution. In layman's term, how much profit you give me through your purchases. The second, the depth of this direct economic contribution. What is the depth? Suppose you're buying, going to Kroger and buying a few items. So what can Kroger do to extract more things from them? They can say, well, we also have a travel agency inside. We also have a bank inside. We also have uh, lottery uh, tickets that you can buy. We also have a cafeteria inside that. So they can upsell, cross-sell, and do a lot more things to extract value from you. But are all customers amenable for that? So this theory guides you in terms of which types of customers you can extract more value, which types of customers you won't be able to extract more value, and so on. And then the third principle is the breadth of this uh, indirect economic contribution, which is something very crucial. The breadth is, if you don't buy from me as a Kroger customer, that's OK. But will you tell your neighbors to come and buy from Kroger? Will you write about me in Facebook saying shopping at Kroger is awesome or shopping at Publix is great? So what can you do to spread the word? And finally, come to our store. What can we do to improve the atmosphere here? They get feedback. So all these things, and many companies have formal mechanism, like Best Buy has got a blue label strategy, which is you, go, you don't find a product there. You can go and customize there and create this product in Best Buy, bluelabel.com. This co those companies that provide this opportunity are doing exceedingly well based on this customer evaluation theoretical framework. And why this theory um, is, is necessary? What do firms, what are the requirements for companies? Let's ask. First requirement for companies are they want to value customers as assets. Second requirement is they need to manage the customers as a portfolio. Why portfolio? Some customers will need more investment. Some customers will need fewer investment. Why is that more and less? It's a very beautiful uh, explanation there. Just imagine you and your wife or your girlfriend, and you tell your girlfriend, sorry, honey, I cannot take you out for dinner tonight. In two different situations, one girlfriend would say, Go to hell, I'm leaving you and going. Another one will say, no problem. No problem, I'm, I'm all yours, I'll wait whenever you have the time. What is the mechanism that explains that? And the mechanism that explains that is the strength of the relationship. Are you in the acquaintance stage? Are you in the well-developed uh, dating stage? Are you in the happily married state? Uh, are you in a divorce state? You know, what is the strength of the relationship state? Without asking them, the couple, based on the transaction behavior between the firm and the customer, our models, we are able to say the strength of the relationship. If the strength is very strong between the firm and the customer, we tell the firm, you don't have to send so much of marketing messages to them. Just one or two is sufficient. They will understand. They are in love with you. So that is what it is. Managing portfolio of customers is which customers need more hand-holding, which customers need less of it. So that is the second requirement for companies. And third is, how do I grow this customer? How do I, I started dating, then I have moved in with this customer, with this girlfriend, and then I married her. So this step-by-step, step, how do I do this? What does it take between a firm and a customer? That's the analogy. So if you take the theory, the three principles of the theory, the direct economic contribution, 
the depth of the direct economic contribution and the breadth of the indirect economic contribution with the three requirements of the company, you see a beautiful nine cell, three by three, where customer lifetime value is a metric that we developed, helps to value customers as assets from the first theoretical principle, which is what is the direct economic value contribution. Then the second metric is that create a portfolio of customers of all high value customers I want. And, and then how do I nurture them? I want to build relationship with these profitable customers. And uh, you see the second set of things, which is the depth. How do I extract more value from the customer? For that, I need to understand what products they are buying, what is the next best product they are likely to buy, and so on. And, and then I need to put them in segments. Like if you talk about Home Depot, who are all the people buying in lumber and plumber wear and, and elect elect electrical items? Then what other things, home and garden, I can sell to them? Are there specific households that I can sell home and garden? Are there specific households that I can sell garden furniture um, and pots and pans, um, seeds, uh, nursery items? We can easily identify based on this. This is the beauty of it. Today, knowing the sequence of products, what products you have bought so far, in what order you have bought, and in what uh, time intervals you have bought, and what the value of these items you have bought in the past, with four pieces of information, we can predict with 87% accuracy what is the next best product we can sell to you. So this is very unique that we have done, and this is possible to implement using the interaction strategy. And finally, where we are today is the engagement, which is the breadth of the indirect economic. If you cannot buy from me, I'm not going to hate you. There was a time Sprint fired customers in August 2007, 1,000 customers because they are not profitable. But today we'll ask that one other additional question. Even though you are not profitable for me, are you able to bring in through referrals or through social media influence or through feedback more money for me? And if the answer is yes, I won't fire you. So this is the engagement concept that we bring in. So this is the link that we have created, very unique, never been done before. And this is the opportunity that we got to present. I got to present twice in Stockholm uh, School of Economics uh, in December 2014 and December, uh, sorry, December 2014 and December 2015, twice. And, and then I've been fortunate to write this as one body of knowledge and published it now in Journal of Marketing. That is basically, um, and if you ask me, does it work? We have implemented it in almost virtually all the industries. If you see there, we have insurance, catalog mailing, high-tech airlines, uh, internet retail, hospitality, telecom. Virtually every industry that you see, we have been able to implement this. And just us, or is there a um, need for this in the marketplace? That is something everybody asks. Just because you developed a theory and you want to just uh, bring it to companies, do they, that's not necessarily true. There is a need for this in every company. Look at Starbucks, one of the top companies, Apple and Netflix. They're all saying that one thing, that every Fortune 500 company measures this number, which is customer lifetime value and has a strategy to maximize it. Netflix today says that virtually 50% of the households have a Netflix streaming. That is the biggest success that the stock market uh, reacted positively to that. But they also struggled one time in terms of retaining this monthly subscription, which is the biggest problem for them, which is when they lose customers on a monthly basis, not um, renewing the subscription, can we anticipate that in advance and prevent that? Meaning, based on the usage of the Netflix, how many times they watch, whether they are daily watch or weekly, and not watched at all, based on the characteristics and the lifestyle of the household, the demographics, we can predict with 90% accuracy they are definitely going to cancel the subscription next month. And then what will Netflix do? They will preempt that and then contact the household not saying you're going to quit next month, but what can we do to increase the value? And, and so this is the way we create a trigger and save uh, companies. So, but today, this is so popular, yet only 42% of the companies, which is even a higher number, is able to say we are able to measure. And the story continues. You know, Netflix is publicly saying that the customer lifetime value is $290. Harris and Am Amazon Prime. So all of them state 
in their own words, what is the lifetime value of their customer. So they are able to do this with the help of this customer valuation theory which we developed, the metrics that we have offered and shown how, to, how it works, and are able to put in the strategies behind it. And I'll show you what are the strategies that they put behind it. Um, before I go to the strategies, people will ask, is it only beneficial for companies to make more money? And absolutely not. It helps the customers lead a better quality of life. It helps the community, it helps the environment, it, it helps the investors, everybody, because we prevent wastage of resources. How? Example, if we are sending a lot of direct, ma pieces um, direct mail communication, and we say we are optimizing it, instead of 60 million, you need to send 30 million, we are saving so much wood and paper. You know, that's just one example. And, and then in terms of you know, salesperson's time to go and visit a client, you don't need to make 10 visits, you need to make only three visits. That saves fuel cost and pollution. So across the board, through our optimal uh, marketing contact, we are able to save um, the planet from getting worse, as also helping the customers make the right decisions. So in terms of the thought leadership that you see here, collective representation, what can firms do? So th these are the two slides, this slide and the next slide, I clearly bring to you, once you measure lifetime value, what do you do with that? Here we call it a wheel of fortune strategies. There are 14 strategies we show here to maximize that. In layman's term, if a customer is giving $100 profit, what can we do to make them give $1,000 in a legal way, ethical way? That is what it is, these 14 strategies. One strategy, one of the 14 is that, are we over-investing in them? No need to, just optimal investment. Second, do we know what their needs are? Can we predict what is the next product that they need and sell it to them? Yes. Third, are they are coming to the store and buying it. How do we make it easy for them? Make them a multi-channel shopper. Expose them to your website. Expose them to your catalog, uh, you know, so, and the three channels, expose them to your mobile app, the fourth channel. So these are the ways we do to maximize lifetime value. And then what is engagement do you see? The, in terms of the engagement, we say not only you buy from me, but you can also refer, be an influence, and give feedback. This is another integrative framework uh, has been done at our center uh, at Georgia State. Very unique, this customer engagement framework today Virtually every newspaper, every media, everywhere you will see people talk about engagement. So we bring a common definition to this engagement. We bring a common metric, common strategy to this engagement and show that how it benefits everyone. So what have we done? I'll just close it with the last three, four slides, which is what is unique about our center at Georgia State University? If you look at the SEPSUM affiliated faculty. We have about uh, 29 to 30 people at any given time. 12 of them are PhD students, two students per year over a six year period. And they are the marketing department PhD students. They work with all the faculty. And we have six research active faculty working in the center, 12 PhD students. We have six full-time staff. We have four visiting scholars. And we have uh, three graduate students, all of them working towards the common cause which is to produce cutting edge knowledge, that is measured as how many publications we have had through this effort. 369 total in all journals. And the faculty and the students in our center have published 50. But if you take just the cream of the cream, um, top 50, uh, top four journals in the FT50, you see students have published 26 and the faculty 124, together 150. This is again a unique number. This puts us in a, I'll tell you the rank. Look at this rank. Uh, currently, Georgia State is ranked number two for publications in the top three journals. Only Wharton School is ahead of us in the UT Dallas database ranking. You know, it's official ranking, all verified. Compared to a ranking of about, about 100, we were 106 10 years ago to number two today. I, just, I wanted to highlight that point. That's something that I think you know, we think about you know, the ROI, the return on investment of our university system that, that's relevant in the marketplace. Um, number two in publications, this is in the world? It's in the whole world, one? yes. Okay. Wharton is number one, we are number two. 
and I have the printout to leave it with you, you know. And, and then if you take the top four journals, be, because the fourth journal we don't publish, which is uh, in a consumer behavior area, because we take data and publish, so we call ourselves this quantitative marketing strategy discipline. We don't do uh, just pure psychology-based work, uh, because that, that is an excellent piece of body of knowledge that people work on that explains why people buy. But the companies tell us, we know why people buy. Tell us how to sell more to them. And therefore, our research focuses on quantitative marketing strategy. So the rank today as hot as today is really is, is number two uh, in, in the top three journals. And in terms of the recognition, our faculty, Sepsum faculty, has won 156 awards and recognitions. Uh, 156 awards and 65 recognitions, and our doctoral student, which is something very unique in our Georgia State. 16 of our doctoral students consecutively have won the best doctoral dissertation awards, or the best doctoral dissertation proposal awards. And you can see some of them have been listed here for your thing. And total 52. They graduate with the most number of publications, they graduate with a lot of job offers, and they, their uh, starting salary averages more than $200,000 per year today. So that is the kind of uh, impact. And the publication record and the awards, you know, I've also sliced by the number of dissertation awards and the proposal. Because our bread and butter is our research active faculty, the junior faculty that we recruit, and the PhD students that are there in the center. So I bring both of them, to both these groups together, and the companies come and give us a problem to solve, and the university provides us with all the necessary resources, and so we work excellent as a team. You know, so where are these students placed? You and know, you see Texas A&M. You, you said the average salary for our PhD students is two hundred thousand dollars. Some of them getting two twenty thousand dollars. And that's a starting salary when that they're is placed. A when they are placed out of exactly. your program. Yes. I'm looking for more PhD students, yeah. <laughs> so, so we we can. I mean, this is something that we are so proud of that, uh, in fact, today I, I, I had breakfast with another dean of a major business school, and he came and said that, you know, we hired one of your students, we want to keep hiring as many students as you give to us. And, and that, is, that is the kind of uh, relationship that we have built with other business schools, that the deans come to our center and say, we want to hire your student. Um, you know, so, of course, they say one other statement before that, if we cannot hire you, <laughs> we will at least hire your students, you know. So, so but then, you know, this is something very uh, nicely uh, stated. And the companies that we have worked with here, you know, you see, uh, you know, some of the companies are not in existence today. Airtran, mm -hmm. we worked a lot uh, building the loyalty program for them. And we have a uh, few international companies like HSBC and ICICI Bank. You had ING when I was the ING chair in Connecticut. And then in locally here in Atlanta, you have Chick-fil-A, you have Coca-Cola, you have Home Depot, UPS, Georgia Aquarium, and so, so many companies that we have worked, implemented these concepts, and they have seen multi-billion um, dollar gains. I know you, you gave me a short time and I ran through this, but the idea is you have a copy of the presentation and I didn't want to lose you also with a longer presentation, just to whet your appetite at, at, uh, at your, I'm at your beck and call, so anytime you say I'm happy to come and elaborate on any particular topic here. Yeah. How do we engage, and I, uh, we want to wrap up for the next committee meeting, but I'll, ver to draw this to a fine point, how do we engage your center for businesses in our community? I mean, every community has a couple top businesses, whether it's a trucking operation, uh, whether it's a, you know, a, a rest, uh, whether it's poultry operations, whether it's IT, how do we engage your center and connect them to our people to put these things into play? Yeah, uh, the simplest way is they first come to our center and state what their situation is and what keeps them sleepless at night. And then we translate that into a business, the business problem into a research question. And then we ask for the necessary data. Or if you have to collect data, then they spend the money collect, uh, helping us collect the data. And we build the model, and we tell them you can use it. 
in return, we just want to publish it, and they give us chance to publish it. So that's the circumstance where they've got a problem that they want research around. So that that's that's kind of that model. What about yes. the model if people want to take things you've already researched that yes. exists in a body of knowledge that they want to put into practice? How is that done? Uh, yeah, that is uh, sort of a consulting, and then uh, we we have not engaged in that so far because we are just purely because every one of this model is built by a PhD student, it be becomes his or her thesis. Mm -hmm. That's why it becomes award-winning. But if there is a lot of request for using existing body of knowledge, then I think I'm sure in our college we can set up a wing that will help to do that. Our center's mission itself is not consulting, it's thought leadership. Right. But um, we can help if by engaging. If there is a lot of volume of business, then I'm sure our school president and the dean would be happy to engage in that. You know, okay. so. Any last questions for Dr. Coomer? Anybody? Hearing none, thank you so much for being with us today. Appreciate your, your presentation. Appreciate your being with us uh, for, for, the, for, the, for the recognition. I know you had some of your staff and some of your research with, researchers with you here earlier. And Definitely, thank you. Thank you for the time and the honor and everything. And you have a copy of the presentation with you? We do, um, yes sir. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we, so, just, uh, uh, and Anything else you need uh, later on, let me know. I apologize know. for the chaos, the legislative process and schedules and things shifting No, around, no, no, I uh, mean, I, I, this is the day that I'll never forget in my life. You have given me that kind of a day, all of you, state of Georgia, and I'm immensely thankful, and I, I'm like, I don't know, I'm in cloud nine, I don't know how I'm going to come down. Uh, uh, so, but it is, it is something, uh, it's 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 a gift. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. And with that, uh, appreciate everybody being here with us today. A lot, lot of folks were here. Um, follow up with Dr. Coomer after for questions if you have them, and uh, we stand adjourned.